So we'll get as it is. Chapter four, Transcendental Knowledge. Text number 35. So let's begin by offering respects to the Prabhupada. Namo Vishnu Vraya Krishna Prasthai Bhutte. Dimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tanamane. Namaste Saraswatun Deve. Oravani Bhacharane. Nirvishe Shashinivadi Paskatyade Satarane. Yajgatana Punamaham Evam Yasisi Pandava Yena Buddha Nishe Shani Rakshas Rakshash Yasmanyato Mayi. Having obtained real knowledge from a self realized soul, you'll never fall into again into such illusion. For by this knowledge, you will see that all living beings are a part of the Supreme. Or in other words, that they are mine. Purport. The result of receiving knowledge from a self-realized soul, or one who knows things as they are, is learning that all living beings are parts and parcels of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna. This sense of an existence separate from Krishna is called maya. Ma, not, yeah, this. Some think that we have nothing to do with Krishna. That Krishna is only a great historical personality and that the absolute truth is impersonal Brahman. Bakshi is stated in the Bhagavad Gita, this impersonal Brahman is the personal effulgence of Krishna. Krishna, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the cause of everything. In the Brahma Samhita, is clearly stated that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the cause of all causes. Even the millions of incarnations are only his different expansions. Similarly, the living entities are also expansions of Krishna. The Mayavadi philosophers wrongly think that Krishna loses his own existence in his many expansions. This thought is material in nature. We have experience in the material world that think that a thing, when fragmentally distributed, loses its own original identity. But the Mayavadi philosophers fail to understand that absolute means that one plus one is equal to one, that one minus one is also equal to one. This is the case in the absolute world. <clears throat> For one, for want of sufficient knowledge in the absolute science, we are now covered with illusion. Therefore, we think that we are separate from Krishna. Although we are separated parts of the Krishna, we are nonetheless not different from him. The bodily difference of the living entities is maya, or not factual. We are all meant to satisfy Krishna. By maya alone, Arjuna thought that the temporary bodily relationship for this kinsman was more important than his eternal relationship, spiritual relation with Krishna. The whole teaching of the Gita is targeted towards this end, that a living being is Krishna's eternal servant cannot be separated from Krishna. In a sense of being an identity apart from Krishna is called maya. The living entities is separated parts and parcels of the Supreme I have a purpose to fulfill. Having forgotten that purpose, since time immemorial, they are situated in different bodies as men, animals, demigods, etc. Such bodily differences arise from forgetfulness of the transcendental service of the Lord. But when one is engaged in the transcendental service through Krishna consciousness, one becomes at once liberated from this illusion. One can acquire such pure knowledge only from the bona fide spiritual master and thereby avoid the delusion that the living entity is equal to Krishna. Perfect knowledge is that the Supreme Soul, Krishna, 
is the supreme shelter for all living entities. In giving up such shelter, living entities are deluded by the material energy, imagining themselves to have a separate identity. Thus, under different standards of material identity, they have become forgetful of Krishna. When, however, such deluded living entities become situated in Krishna consciousness, we understood that they are on the path of liberation, as confirmed in the Bhagavatam. 2.10.6 Muktira Hidvanita Rupam Rupena Vyavastiti Liberation means to be situated in one's constitutional position as an eternal servitor of Krishna, Krishna consciousness. Verse again, Yaj Gyatvana Punya Maham Evam Yasasi Pandava Yena Bhutan Asheshani Rakshas Yatnini Tomayi. Having obtained real knowledge from a self realized soul, you'll never fall again into such illusion. But by this knowledge, you'll see that all living beings are a part of the Supreme. In other words, that they are mine. Om Agyana Timanandasya Gananjana Salakaya Chaksur Militam Yena Tazmai Shi Guravena Maha Shi Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Vayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Sva Padanti Kam. In the previous verse, Krishna had told Arjuna, Tadvidi Prani Patena. Pari Parshena Sevaya, Upadik Shanti Te Gyanam, Gyaninas Tatvadarshana. Let's try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master, inquire from him submissively, and render service to him. The self realized souls can impart knowledge unto you because they have seen the truth. So here we find out what the truth is. The truth is that. There's nothing outside of Krishna. The only thing outside of Krishna is our being situated in illusion, our thinking that there's something other than Krishna or Krishna's expansions and his energies. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita is meant to give us the information of what to do to develop the vision so that we can see things properly again. That is the vision devoid of illusion. As I mentioned last time, I believe, at the end of the 18th chapter, Krishna had asked Arjuna, had he been listening to the to his recitation and his instructions with attention? Kachit etachutamparta vayakagrana chetasa Kachit Agana Samoha Pranatas Te Dananjaya. This is 18, 69, 60, 70, 70, 71, 72. Gives it 72. 1872. Kachit Eta Chutam Parta Tvayaka Grana Chetasa. My dear Arjuna, how you've been listening with rapt attention, with perfect attention? And is your illusion now dispelled? Kuchit Agana Samoha, is your ignorance and illusion now dispelled? So, okay. current. So, Illusion means we think that we're different from Krishna and everyone else is different from Krishna. Or there's something going on outside of Krishna's control. Because as Prabhupada mentions here, we have to avoid the Mayavadi conception that although we're simultaneously one with Krishna, we're also different from him quantitatively. We're very tiny and Krishna is unlimitedly great. So how to reach that conclusion? Krishna just asked Arjuna, have you been listening with attention? In other words, if one hears the transcendental sound vibration 
about Krishna from the right source, the right attitude, then our ignorance and illusion will be dispelled. Now, to come to that platform requires devotional service, at least practicing devotional service. For instance, we're all listening now to Krishna as he speaks Bhagavad Gita. And as much as we pay attention, then we will experience what Krishna is talking about. Because the sound vibrations are transcendental and they convey the information, the realizations within them. But then Krishna says in the fourth chapter, Gata Sangasya Muktasya, Yanavastit Chetasaha, Ejacharata Karma, Samagram Praviliate. That the work of a man who is unattached to the material modes of nature and who is situated in transcendental knowledge merges entirely into transcendence. So, what's preventing us from hearing with rapt attention? Two things. One is that we're attached to the modes of material nature. And the second thing is when we don't have full transcendental knowledge. So what does it mean to be attached to the material modes of nature? It means we still have hope that somehow or another we can enjoy in the material world. We still have the tendency to believe that my reality that I'm currently situated in is actually real reality in the terms of that I'm actually a material body rather than a soul living in a material existence, experience. And that there's something outside of Krishna or that if Krishna is everything, above Krishna is Brahman. Now, in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has told Arjuna that we're not this body. So that's something perceivable by us with our intelligence. The fact that our bodies are changing, but we're not changing, is perceivable. And both the Maya bodies and even a materialist who has some intelligence will agree that the soul is actually eternal. But to understand Paramatma within the heart requires much more detachment and knowledge. But even that can be gained by simply hearing from the right source how there is a director in our hearts providing us with remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. But still, it's more subtle. And one can easily imagine that oneself, somehow or another, we're providing our own remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. That all living entities of God even the ant is God, because the ant also has remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. If you go to step on an ant, the ant will not bow down before you and say, please step on me hard, hard love. No, he'll run away the best he can, because he also has intelligence it's not very pleasant to get squashed. So the, the materialists will think that this is instinct, which, makes, which doesn't mean anything. You can call anything instinct. The spirits will say, well, actually, the ant is also God. He's a self-supplier of his own knowledge remembrance and forgetfulness. And the devotee will say that Krishna is in everyone's heart and that Krishna is directing the wanderings of all living entities and 
every living entity qualitatively is equal to every other living entity, but they ta- have different material experiences. Now, the devotee, if one wants to become a devotee or be a devotee, one has to at least theoretically accept that. Vidya, Vinaya, Sampane, Brahmani, Kavi, Hastani, Juni, Chaiva, Svapaketa, Pandita, Samadarshana, that the learned, uh, the learned sages, by virtue of true knowledge, be with, sees with an equal vision the learned and gentle Brahman, the cow, the dog, and the dog eater. But how does one come to that platform of seeing all living entities as spiritual beings, not only theoretically understanding it, but what does it mean to accept it? In other words, all living entities include ourselves, that we're all spiritual and that we're all in within us as the Supreme Lord. Therefore, in the previous verse, Krishna says, uh, what did he say? Uh, when one's faith, one's mind, one's intelligence, one's refuge are all fixed in the Supreme, and one becomes fully cleansed of all misgivings through complete knowledge, and thus proceeds straight on the path of self-realization. Uh, let's see where the first order of that verse is. This is chapter four. Chapter four. Chapter five. Tad Buddhas, Tad Atmanas, Tad Nishtas, Tad Parainaha, the Chant Yapuna Avritim, Janani Duta Kalmashaha. So, first of all, we have to use our intelligence. But that intelligence has can be utilized in two ways. One is to understand our relationship with Krishna, that everything here is Krishna's energy, and therefore it's supposed to be utilized in his service, and therefore engage our minds in hearing about Krishna. And as we engage our minds in hearing about Krishna, and we practice devotional service, then the experience of Krishna consciousness becoming more and more conscious of Krishna means our our faith will develop. And as our felt faith develops, then we'll naturally seek shelter in Krishna. We'll understand that although we're in the we're, although we're spiritual beings, right now we're in the material world. And the material world is a dangerous place. We may be confident that because we're performing devotional service, therefore our next destination is at least the heavenly planets. That's certainly true. Practically speaking, every devotee, even if they they perform devotional service, sincerely over a period of time, is certainly at least going to the heavenly planet. The only problem is the heavenly planet is a very short vacation. And one has to come back again to this mature world, to this earthly type of planet. The problem with that is that we don't know when we're going to come back to the earthly planet. If we're enjoying in the heavenly planet, for some number of years, thousands of years, it's certainly a nice vacation. But as we all know, the more pleasant 
life is, the quicker it goes. For instance, I remember being in school, waiting for the vacation. Can't wait for the summer vacation. And it seemed that whenever the summer vacation came, it went so quickly, I was back in school again. School went slowly, the summer vacation went very quickly. It's just like when the dent, you hear you're in the dentist's office and they, the dentist gives you the bad news that you have a number of teeth that have to be drilled. So then you hear the sound of the drill and time suddenly goes very slowly. You can imagine when I first went to the dentist when I was five years old, whatever, they never use any anesthesia. They just drilled on the on the tooth without any anesthesia. So it was a very painful experience. So the least fa favorite time of my life was when I went to the dentist. And at that time, the dentist, to make a living, they found cavities that didn't exist. Probably they found cavities, teeth that didn't even exist. So inevitably, every time you went to the dentist, you'd be there for what seemed to be forever, just listening to the sound of the drill and being tortured. The time went very, very slowly. I was considering one moment to be like 12 years or more. And literally tears were flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain. But similarly, when we go to the heavenly planets, life is good. Prashadam is fantastic. Cooks are great. Everything is clean and neat. Everyone is friendly. You never have to worry about paying your bills. Everything is fantastic there, but it goes very quickly, like a summer vacation or a weekend. And if we come back here at the end of Kali Yuga, it'll be very unpleasant. If there's a Sunday feast, when we come back, we'll be part of the menu at the end of Kali Yuga. Therefore, one should try to take it seriously that the material world is a very dangerous place and that this repetition of birth and death is the most dangerous thing that could happen to the soul. Therefore, when the faith and refuge, now, generally speaking, for the most people or for ourselves, because we've been trained up in a certain way. If something goes wrong, we have a whole list of solutions. First of all, check the internet to find out what the solution to the problem is. How many likes to that solution? How many thumbs down to that solution? And if nothing else works, then we say, Krishna, please help me. So the question is, where on a list of solutions does Krishna lie? Is he on the top or is he somewhere lost in between numerous solutions? Now, when Krishna becomes our refuge, that takes great advancement. That's called surrender. As Rupa Goswami points out, anukulyasya sankalpe pratikulyasya varjanam arshisa titi vishvaso koptrave varnam tata. We're trying to accept things favorable for devotional service. And if we do that successfully, as I said before, devotional service is not a weekend sport. It's an eternal occupation. Therefore, if every day we have a program, 
where we try to hear and chant about Krishna in the association of our family or other devotees. It doesn't have to be a big show. We don't have to have five madungas, three cartel players, huge Vyasasan, and Radha Krishna deities, Lord Ramachandra deities, and Lord Jagannath deities in our house in order to have a morning program. Now, simply by chanting Hare Krishna is sufficient. As a matter of fact, we don't have to even have a picture of Krishna. As that Brahmin in the Nectar devotion, he had no money, he had nothing. He didn't even have any food to offer to the deity. But still, after hearing from the sages, he sat down in meditation every day, and within his mind, he brought water from the, he envisioned deities and brought water from the sacred places for those deities in golden and silver pots of all the sacred rivers, the Jamuna, the Narmada, the Saraswati, the Ganges. He bathed the deities, he dressed the deities within his mind, and he even cooked for the deities within the mind. Of course, this requires tremendous concentration. But he did it for many, many years. And eventually he achieved perfection by such an endeavor. Point is, we don't need elaborate worship to please Krishna. We, we need sincere endeavor to try to please him. And appreciation, the fact that we have the gift of devotional service. In other words, if we become too familiar with the process of devotional service and take it for granted and not realize the great opportunity that it provides us, then of course we may not take our opportunity to hear and chant together very seriously. In Spanish, they say mañana. Tomorrow I'll do it. <laughs> right now I don't feel like it. Tomorrow I'll feel like it. Therefore, intelligence is very important to understand the value of the opportunity and to understand that when we use our intelligence, first of all, we have to conquer our minds. Because as spiritual beings embodied in the material body, since time immemorial, we become accustomed to taking our feel, our mood very important as very important. Or as I used to say in ISKCON, if we just distribute books and everything, Krishna will supply everything. And now sometimes the devotees say, if we just get everything we need, then we'll have the opportunity to distribute books. In other words, let me satisfy my mind, and when my mind is satisfied, then I'll distribute books, then I'll preach, then I'll perform devotional service. But that day is never going to come. Generally speaking, only for a very advanced devotee, will the mind say, let's do devotional service. If we ask our mind, the mind will say, we ask our mind, what should I do today? The mind will say, I have a perfect schedule for you of eating and sleeping. And in the meantime, they may have to do a few other things, but the most important things on your schedule is when you eat and sleep, you can't miss that. Everything else is optional. Try to chant your rounds as quickly as possible so your mind doesn't get disturbed by the Hare Krishna mantra.
oh, we have to use our intelligence and see that our minds are not necessarily going to give us the best intelligence, the best information. Or if we, or is it necessary to follow the whatever mood our mind is in and take that as the most important thing in our schedule to satisfy the mind? And if we ignore the mind, or at least engage the mind in, in Krishna's service, then the result is that we'll experience something beyond the material existence. And that something, in the next verse, of one of the verses I I quoted, Brahmarpanam Brahma Haivir, Brahmagno Brahma Hutam, Pranaiva Tena Gantavyam, Brahma Karma Samadina. That the person who's unattached to the mode of material nature and is situated in transcendental knowledge and whose consciousness is merged into transcendence, for him, The person, this is Bhagavad Gita 424. The person who is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom because of his full contribution to spiritual activities, of which the consummation is absolute. And that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. So this verse explains the importance of becoming conscious of Krishna. We're not trying to change the world. We're trying to change our consciousness. We're not trying to correct everyone in our vision. We're trying to correct our our own understanding of reality. That's all we have to do. And if we do that, if we become conscious of Krishna, if Krishna actually are able to experience Krishna, not only within our hearts, envision Krishna as the Brahmin did, and worship him within our hearts in some way or another, but also see Krishna outside, how everything and everyone is related to Krishna. That's sufficient to become an empowered preacher without even saying anything. One time Prabhupada was sitting in his room and some ladies came. They came from a society where their philosophy was silence. They judge a person, his advancement, by how long he could keep silent. So they requested if they could go and see Prabhupada, and the Prabhupada's servant let them go in, and for 20 minutes they sat there, a darshan of Srila Prabhupada. And when they came out, the first thing they said is that your spiritual master is very, very advanced. Because during the whole time, Prabhupada didn't even say a word. He just sat there. Prabhupada knew people's hearts, and therefore he reciprocated with them accordingly. But because within Prabhupada's heart itself were the pastimes of Krishna going on, therefore, those who were a little receptive, they could actually experience transcendence just by being in Prabhupada's presence. Prabhupada didn't even have to say anything. Because if the spiritual world is there, it speaks for itself. Similarly, there is a transcendental television within our hearts also. And if we turn into on-channel Krishna, 
then we'll also see Krishna's names, forms, qualities, pastimes, and associates. It's not that only Srila Prabhupada had transcendental television set in his heart, but we find in the Bhagavad Gita, Sanjaya also had that transcendental television. Narada Muni had that transcendental television. All the devotees, like Prahlad Maharaj, were constantly thinking about Krishna in their hearts. And we can do the same thing if we follow the process. Follow the process, we'll repair our television set, and we can also turn on to channel Krishna and see Krishna's pastimes within ourselves and without. Because after all, this material world, according to the Srimad Bhagavatam, the second canto, is also a pastime of Krishna. There's nothing but pastimes of Krishna. This is the pastime of the incarnations, because we're all incarnations. Unfortunately, we're in, we can be called the mudha incarnation, the full incarnations. So this is the pastime of the illusory energy chastising the full incarnations, ourselves. But we don't have to stay fools. We can become pure again and see the reality. Actually, Vyasadeva, he was also seemingly situated in the mature world. But when he sat down for meditation, according to the instructions of his Guru Maharaj, Narada Muni, then he saw Krishna within his heart. And along with Krishna, he saw on the backside, he saw the illusory energy. And then he saw that all the living entities, Ya Samho Ita Jiva Atmakam Trigunatmakam, that all the living entities in this world, they're also spiritual beings. But yes, but they're completely covered by illusion. And because they're covered by illusion, they're undergoing the threefold miseries. Just like if you watch a movie and you identify when when we, we identify ourselves with the hero of the movie, but when the hero is in trouble, he got stabbed or something, then we feel pain. We feel distressed. Now, we didn't get stabbed. And the reality is that even the, the, the actor in the, in the movie generally doesn't get stabbed either. So our distress is just illusory. Similarly, there's a reality of the material world, but because we m misunderstand it, we misperceive it, we have the wrong mood about it, the wrong in, in, uh, understanding about it. Therefore, we find ourselves in distress for the threefold miseries. But if we take shelter of the process, the devotional service, and utilize whatever energies we have in Krishna's service, then the illusory energy, because it is an energy, it's a per she's a person, Maya, She's not trying to torture the living entities uselessly out of spite or envy. He's doing it to awaken the living entity to his eternal service, Krishna. So when we perform devotional service with a proper understanding, with a proper mood, Tad Buddha, Tad Atma, Tad Nishta, with the proper faith, and actually take shelter of Krishna, then the result is that Maya gradually <clears throat> goes away, and Krishna gives us more and more intelligence by which we can make progress in devotional service. And what happens? As Prabhupada writes in the purport, that the Lord is spiritual and the rays of his transcendental body are called Brahma Jyoti, his spiritual effulgence. Everything that exists is situated in that Brahma Jyoti. 
But when that jyoti is covered by illusion, maya is sense gratification, it is called material. In other words, what we're seeing is Krishna is Brahma Jyoti. But because our consciousness is covered by the desire to enjoy the senses, therefore we see it as material. Actually, there's nothing called material. It's all spiritual. Material means that we think that it's not spiritual. That's all. Our perception is, is wrong. That's called illusion. But Prabhupada writes, this material veil can be removed at once by Krishna consciousness. That's the offering for the sake of Krishna consciousness, etc. So Krishna consciousness means everything here belongs to Krishna. It's all Krishna's energy. We're all Krishna's energy. And I should utilize whatever energy I have what Krishna has provided to me, I should utilize it in his service. That desire to do so is called Krishna consciousness. Or when Krishna reveals himself to us because of such a desire, then we become aware of Krishna. And when it's Krishna conscious, as Prabhupada writes, thus this material veil can be removed at once by Krishna consciousness. That's the offering for the sake of Krishna consciousness. Now, this is a very important point. For instance, if I'm a householder, I don't, if I want to become Krishna conscious, if I want to be a devotee, I don't really have a choice. I, of course, I have, we always have a choice. But the most valuable possession I have is my wife and children. And therefore, I should make sure, to the best of my ability, to engage my wife and children and my husband in the service of Krishna. Then the result is, if I have that mentality, then I'll see my wife and children and husband in relationship to Krishna. And therefore, my relation with them will be spiritual. But if I leave Krishna out of the equation, my wife and children and don't do the best I can to engage them in Krishna service, then they'll become material to me. Then material nature will force me to see them in a material way and my relationship with them will become material. And material means uh, that which in the beginning is bitter like Vishaya uh, Vinivarta Vishaya what is it? That in the mode of goodness, <laughs> we may have the urge to gratify our senses, but we don't take it. We take Krishna consciousness as more important. In the mode of passion, sense gratification is the object. And it tastes nice in the beginning, but at the end it's like poison. And an ignorance is bitter at the beginning and it's worse at the end. So as soon as we lose our consciousness of Krishna, as soon as we forget that everything here is this property, including myself, and including the things that I have in relationship to myself, including the personalities within the, my existence. As soon as I forget that, then my consciousness becomes spiritual, material, and therefore my treating of other living entities will be inappropriate for spiritual advancement. And the result is we'll chew the chewed. We have to ha get happiness from our relationships because happiness is our nature. And our nature is to have relationships, happy relationships. So in the material world, we become confused that we can chew on our relationships and get happiness from them. Instead of engaging our relationships in relation to Krishna, we think I can chew on my relationships in relationship to my senses 
and that will make me happy. Yes, the beginning it might be so, but at the end it becomes bitter. That's how the material nature works. If we have the wrong consciousness, even Krishna consciousness will seem bitter. Just like when Krishna, after he defeated the Kaliya serpent, he was with his coward boyfriends on the bank of the Jamuna, and there appeared this big crane named Bakasura. And Bakasura at once swallowed Krishna. Now Krishna's body is sweet like sugar candy. Even Krishna enjoys sucking on his tongue, th uh, his big toe, at the when there's nothing else to do, at the during the annihilation of the universe, and the waters of dev devastation fill up the universe. Krishna lies on a banyan leaf, and he spends the time by sucking his th his big toe because he had heard from his devotees that his lotus feet are very sweet. They, he spends some millions of years experimenting how sweet his toes are. So Krishna's body is very sweet, like sugar candy, very enjoyable. But when Bakasura swallowed Krishna, he tasted Krishna tasted very bitter to Bakasura, because he was a demon. And therefore he, he threw up, vomited Krishna. He couldn't swallow him because Krishna was too bitter for him. So anyone who's in material consciousness, after some time, everything becomes bitter. The things that we were trying to enjoy, instead of beco increasingly becoming enjoyable, gradually they become distasteful. Therefore, we want to have a happy household life, happy relationships with others. It has to be in Krishna consciousness, or else it'll turn bitter after some time. Only in the fairy tales, the people live happily ever after. Nowadays, there's very few people even read fairy tales or believe in them. Therefore, Prabhupada writes that this material veil can be removed at once by Krishna consciousness. That's the offering for the sake of Krishna, whatever energy you are offering to Krishna. The consuming agent of such an offering or contribution, we can offer prasadam to the two devotees, for instance. The process of consumption. Maharaj, I'm so sorry. So sorry, w where are you reading this from? I'm sorry, I can't catch up. If you just give me a reference, please. Yeah, this is Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, text number 24. This is the purport. Thank you. I didn't realize it was a purport to this verse. I'm sorry. Thank you. No problem. So we're up to that. It says uh, the contri the uh, the process of consumption. Do you see that? Uh, it begins with uh, yes, Maharaj. I'm all caught up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Process of consumption. The contributor and the result are all combined together. Brahman or the absolute truth. The absolute truth covered by Maya is called matter. Matter dovetailed for the cause of the absolute truth regains the spiritual quality. Krishna consciousness is the process of converting the illusory consciousness into Brahman or the Supreme. So we're not that's all we're trying to convert. We're, we're really not even trying to convert anyone else to Krishna consciousness. We can't do that. All these things are beyond our capacity. We're not the super soul in everyone's heart, giving people remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness, or purifying them, or, or appearing in their heart, enlightening them. But we can convert our illusory consciousness into Brahman or the Supreme. So when the mind is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness, it's said to be in samadhi or trance. Anything done that says transcendental consciousness is called yagya, 
or a sacrifice for the absolute. In that condition of spiritual consciousness, the contributor, contribution, the consumption, the performer or leader of the performance, and the result of the ultimate gain, everything becomes one in the absolute truth, in the absolute the Supreme Brahman. That is a method of Krishna consciousness. So it's very simple. Hear about Krishna from the right source, with the right attitude. Become inspired to utilize whatever energies we have, including our body and things in relation to the body, our intelligence, our faith, well, intelligence, our mind, our faith, our refuge in Krishna's service. And the result is Krishna will lift the illusion from our consciousness and then we'll be situated in actually Krishna consciousness. We'll be with Krishna, Krishna's associates, and we'll see that all living entities are also eternally Krishna's servants. And that the material nature is not working independently of Krishna. It's working for only one purpose, to bring everyone back to Krishna. So we become, we go back to Krishna, or we're back in Krishna consciousness, then our life is perfect, and everything we do after that will also be perfect. And we'll be able to assist Krishna, his mission to help others become Krishna conscious too. So the more we understand this, the more we utilize our energies in the service of Krishna and his mission, the more we become Krishna conscious, then the more we can help others solve their, make an ultimate solution to all problems of life too. So thank you for listening. Any questions or comments? Ganadas. Hare Krishna Gurudev, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Glories just, to Prabhupada. Wanted, just wanted to share something. Just one hour ago, there was a young boy and he was eating chapati. And I asked, Who is Krishna? And he said, The Lord. And then I asked, What, what, is, what is he doing? He's He's listening to us. Great. Otherwise, how could he have gotten that party? Thank you. Anything else? Oh, Maharaj, I have a question, but uh, uh, just about what, um, <clears throat> just it's in my stock of question, I see nobody's asking. What's that? Uh, Prabhupada said that, uh, that is it true that Prabhupada said that there is no no need for borders in the world? That uh, like when you cross a border with a passport, um, and if it's true, then uh, uh, I was uh, first thing I want to know if it's true. If that was part of Prabhupada. I never. Well, right now, it wouldn't make any difference because when, as long as people are in the material concept of life then there's going to be borders. Even when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was here, that when they went from one part of India to the next, there would be toll gates. You had to pay a toll tax. So borders are not bad. The people are Krishna conscious. For instance, in the Vedic culture also, civilized people used to live in the cities and uncivilized people lived outside the cities outside certain place they live in a certain place so that goes on even the spiritual world you have Ayodhya you have Vaikuntha you have Dwarka you have Goloka Vrindavan and generally speaking there's although living entity could 
those in Vaikuntha theoretically could desire to go to Goloka Vrindavan, but generally they don't. And those in Goloka Vrindavan, they generally don't go to Vaikuntha. They, they're happy where they are. So people naturally have boundaries. Anything else? So, anyone like to say what they've understood in a sentence or two from the lecture? Does anyone like to share anything, their own realizations or experience with the lecture, what the verse is about? I I would like to. Uh, I I remember you mentioned you said uh, when we listen when we listen about Krishna, then we develop more faith and. When we develop more faith, when we develop the faith, and then we take a shelter of Krishna more easy, easier. And uh, when we take the, the the shelter in Krishna, then this is great advancement. Yes, very good. Come in. Anyone else like to share something? Yeah, it does. Mm, that this uh, material world is a dangerous place and to go to heavenly planet is also dangerous for our devotional service or can be dangerous and to learn to appreciate uh, the opportunity to hear and chant about Krishna together ultimately to, to reach the, the goal to, to go back to Krishna hey, yes very nice anyone else like to share something Хари Кришна, Гуру Махарадж, Хари Кришна, дорогие преданные. Я запомнила такой нюанс, что все, что касаемо Кришны, как бы и сада, на который мы идем, и садья, которая является Кришна, это не раздельно, это не одно, это как бы это одно и то же. Если в материальном мире это раздельные вещи, то здесь и преданное служение, и сам Кришна, то есть и процесс, и сам Господь это одно и то же. И еще... Матушка, так, секунду, эту переведу, потом вторую часть, хорошо? Окей. So, Лера, Матаджи is saying that she, um, um, she remembers an interesting nuance that you said, that she realized from this lecture, is that Krishna and the process to which we follow in Krishna consciousness, such as our sadhana and sangha, is actually the same thing, that it's an absolute. The process and the Krishna is absolute. И также, чтобы вы напомнили о том, что Шила Прабхупада говорил, что не существует никакого такого понятия, как инстинкт, нет такого слова. То есть все то, что здесь называют вот этим пустым словом инстинкт, это на самом деле это параматма подсказывает, как себя надо вести. То есть, что не существует вообще ничего, грубо говоря, кроме Господа. Ну, не грубо говоря, а кроме Господа Кришны. Yes, and the, another interesting fact that you said, that Srila Prabhupada has mentioned, that there is no such thing as an instinct. That instinct is just an um, uh, empty word. It's not an instinct. It's actually that Krishna is on, uh, in our heart, being a Paramatma, is uh, um, guiding us. So there is no such thing as instinct. Very good. Harisha, Spasiba, Ushoi. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Grant Oh, you're going to, you wanted to share something? No, just a question about the preaching and about the cow. I, I, I used to know the answer, but. Uh... Uh, the sheep gives also milk sometimes, and why they are not respected as mother or buffalo? Because the cow is more than just giving milk. It's also giving cow dung, cow urine. It's also the milk is considered to be 
you know, the best kind of milk because the cow gives it out of love to the calf. Yeah, but these other animals are also respected, but they're not of the same quality as the cow. The cow milk is supposed to also provide uh, purity for the brain. Mm. Higher brain cells, so one will be able to understand Krishna consciousness. Besides that, the bull can plow the land. I don't think a goat can do that. So, <laughs> not only the milk, it also supplies the grains. All right. Thank you very much. Grant Raj, Shemad Bhagavad Gita, Kijai, Shila Prabhupada, Kijai, Gaur Ramananda. Thank Mother Lavanga for her translation work. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj.